it is not necessary for me to write you about the ministry to the saints, for I know your eagerness, which is the subject of my boasting about you to the people of Macedonia, saying that Achaia has been ready since last year, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. But I am sending the brothers in order that our boasting about you may not prove to have been empty in this case, so that you may be ready as I said you would be. The point is this, the one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up in your, no in your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. As it is written, He scatters abroad, He gives to the poor, His righteousness endures forever. May we be blessed in the reading and hearing of God's Word today. And now we welcome to the microphone Dr. Dick Lemke, and he'll bring us a message that God's put on his heart.
Just think about that. If you, how you want people to treat you is the way you should treat them. And I re remember her reciting several times to me when I was young a Bible verse that she had memorized uh, when she was strong or, or was young. And it's from Matthew, the 21st uh, chapter. And it says, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. And then Jesus goes on to say, Truly I tell you, what have you have done to the least person, you have done to me. And just think about that. How we can work within the community to help each other. And I, I remember growing up, we lived on a farm right on the edge of town. And we had a little old lady, her name was Libby. And she had stayed home to take care of her parents and they died. And I, I'm not sure how old Libby was, but she didn't have a car. And once a week, she'd walk into town to get groceries. And uh, I know more than once, if it was raining or snowing, my mother would look out and see her. And for some reason, Mom always, she found an excuse. She had to go to town, and she'd pick her up and take her in to get groceries and wait around and then bring her back home again. And you just think about that, how we can help know other people. Uh, she also, we had a, I guess a de facto member of our family. Her name was Clingy. And her husband died and Clingy was probably 20, 30 years older than my mother and father. And she worked at the local grocery store and she had one daughter who lived in Chicago. And no grandchildren or anything. Her daughter rarely came out to see her. And mom just included her any time there was a holiday, Christmas, Thanksgiving, Easter. Clingy was always part of the family. She was always brought there for dinner. And I, I have to think about those things, uh, how you help other people. And yet at the same time, how we are helped. I know I had an incident, and I know, I'm positive at least, that God had something to do with this. Well, I was 12 years old, school was out for the summer, and I went to visit one of my good friends, Larry, and uh, he wasn't home. And so I thought, well, I wonder what he's doing. So that evening, I rode my bike over to the house again, and he said, oh, I got a job. I said, you got a job? Yeah, he says, the Gumps Brothers, you know, they, they have a big mint farm. And where I grew up, mint is a major crop. Uh, there's about a three-county area where three-fourths of the world's supply of mint oil is raised in those counties. And he said, we have to weed the mint, get all the weeds out of it. And he's paying us 50 cents an hour. And boy, well, back at that time, 50 cents was a lot of money. And he said, Larry told me, he said, and he wants some more, he needs more workers. So I go home and I plead with my parents and they said, okay, you can go tomorrow and, you know, see how you like it and everything. I'll get you up in the morning because they're leaving at 7 o'clock from the service station. My dad had been raised on a farm and where they always got up when the sun came up. And he always set his alarm and I'm not sure whether that alarm worked or not because he was always up before it. He was always awake before 6, 6.30 in the morning. That morning woke me up at about 8 o'clock and he said, I don't know what happened, but I overslept. The alarm didn't go off. And he said, but I, he said, I know the Gums brothers. He said, I'll call them. And he said, I'm sure you can go tomorrow. Well, that evening, they were coming back from working and they were all, they had about a dozen kids or so on the back of a flatbed truck with slides on it. And they hit a bump and the back door or back gate came open. Larry was standing there and he fell out killed. And I have to think, I probably would have been right with him, but somebody, something kept me from being with that trip that time. Uh, and I've had a lot of things happen through the years. And a few years ago, I saw a movie, maybe some of you have seen it, The Bishop's Wife. Uh, Cary Grant is in it, and the bishop is wanting to build a huge cathedral 
he's neglecting his wife and, uh, on some of the other smaller churches so he can build this big cathedral. And he prays, God, please send me help to get this cathedral built. And an angel appears or comes to it. And that's Cary Grant. And he, uh, Cary, is, the angel is trying to get him to do the right things, trying to guide him, you know, maybe the cathedral isn't the very best thing to do. And eventually the bishop gets upset with the angel and he says, just how many of you angels are there around here? And I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit, but Cary turns to him and he says, how many times when you walk down the street and someone smiles at you and you feel better? That's one of us. Just think about that being an angel. Uh, think what would happen when you walk down the street and you smile at someone and they feel better. I tried that going across campus many times and it's shocking the reaction you get from people when you just smile at them. They feel better. Maybe they have a, you know, a little bit better day because of it. And you know, we don't know. Maybe for just a moment you can be an angel. And uh, I found a, a little article several years ago in one of the Chicken Soup books that I'd like to read to you. Um, it writ was written by Art Buckwall. It's called Love in the Cap. And uh, excuse me for reading, but he starts out, he said, I was in New York the other day and rode with a friend in a taxi. When we got out, my friend said to the driver, thank you for the ride. You did a superb job of driving. The taxi driver was stunned for a second and then he said, are you a wise guy or something? And no, my dear man, I'm not putting you on. I admire the way you keep cool and heavy traffic. Yeah, the driver said and drove off. What was that all about, I asked. I am trying to bring love back to New York, he said. I believe it's the only thing that can save this city. <clears throat> it's not, uh, how can one man save New York? It's not one man. I believe I've made that taxi driver's day. Suppose he has 20 fares. He's going to be nice to those 20 fares because someone was nice to him. Those fares in turn will be kinder to their employees or their shopkeepers or waiters or even their own families. Eventually, the goodwill can spread to at least a thousand people. Now, that isn't bad, is it? But you're depending on that taxi driver to pass your goodwill to others. I'm not depending on it, my friend said. I was aware that the system isn't foolproof, so I might deal with ten different people today. If out of ten I can make three happy, then eventually I can indirectly influence the attitudes of three thousand more. It sounds good on paper, I admit it, but I'm not sure it works in practice. Nothing is lost if it doesn't. It didn't take any of my time to tell that man he was doing a good job. He neither received a larger tip nor a smaller tip. If it fell on deaf ears, so what? Tomorrow there will be another taxi driver I can try to make happy. You're some kind of nut, I said. That shows how cynical you have become. I have made a study of this. The thing that seems to be lacking, besides money of course, for our postal workers, is that no one tells people who work for the post office what a good job they're doing. But they're not doing a good job. They're not doing a good job because they feel no one cares if they do or not. Why shouldn't someone say a kind word to them? We were walking past the structure in the process of being built and past five workmen eating their lunch. My friend stopped. That's a magnificent job you men have done. It must be difficult and dangerous work. The workmen eyed my friend suspiciously. When will it be finished? June, the man, the man grunted. Ah, oh, that is, really is impressive. You must all be very proud. <clears throat> we walked away and I said to him, I haven't seen anyone like you since Manuel Mancha. <clears throat> Are you tooling at windmills? When those men digest my words, they will feel better for it. Somehow the city will benefit from their happiness. But you can't do this alone. You're just one man. The most important thing is not to get discouraged. Making people in the city become kind again is not an easy job. But if I can list other people in this campaign, 
hey, you just winked at a play, very plain looking woman, I said. Yeah, I know, he replied. And if she's a school teacher, her class may be in for a fantastic day. <laughs> now, just, just think about that. What we could do if we just could affect one person a day. And then they would affect someone and it would, it would grow. Uh, someone several years ago gave me a little book uh, about what things famous athletes and coaches had said. And I, I saw one that I, I really liked. It was by John Wooden, who was a coach at UCLA. And he says, you can't live a perfect day without doing something for someone who will never be able to repay you. Just think about that. If we could just do something nice for someone, not, not so they'll repay us, but so that we help them. Just think what we could all accomplish if we just did this every day. If tomorrow morning we got up and we thought, there's one person I can help today or say something nice to, what a better world this might be. And I think that's, that's the kind of faith that I have that things are going to be better if we can just be nice to even just one person each day. And I thank you for giving me time to talk to you today. And to me, that's what faith is all about. That's what it's like to be a Christian. Thank you.